Good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Chartrand. I'm the owner and founder of Water Street Bookstore. And um, the mission of the bookstore is to build community, a diverse and vibrant community around the written word. And thank you all for joining us here tonight. You, uh, you and uh, Ned have us all on mission tonight, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Who here hasn't come from a crazy family? <laughs> I don't see any hands raised. <laughs> so we are a tribe tonight. Um, um, full disclosure, I spent 13 years working with a mental health professional, having incredible conversations, and I wasn't cured until she was ready to retire. Um, <laughs> and then I was cured. Uh, it was one of the most significant things I've done in my life. And uh, I want to thank you for um, your profession. You folks literally saved my life. And the fact that, uh, that you come from a family where things were a little mixed up and a little discombobulated, um, that's, that's just how things are in a family. It is literally the, uh, the cauldron that our personalities are formed in. And, uh, I think this may be my favorite event of the year for that reason. Uh, you've been such a great supporter of the bookstore. Uh, you've been a great supporter of the, uh, the Exeter community at large and also the Phillips Exeter Academy community. And that you are very important to us. And I want to welcome you back to Exeter, which is part of your family. Please join me in welcoming you. Thank you so, so, so much, and uh, thank you all for coming out, and including you three sitting there. And uh, you, you mentioned, aren't, aren't you cured yet? I, I, I've been in my analysis that still hasn't formally ended, uh, in that we haven't terminated, I hate that word, about eight years, and someone asked me, aren't you cured yet? <laughs> And I said, well, I am in the way a ham is cured. <laughs> but, so it, it, it's, a, it's not a process that aims at cure. It, it, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what it does aim at, but it's not cure. I can't ever come back to this town. It, it's, it's handy that Exeter is relatively close to Boston because, and I do come up here, you know, with some, I just had my 50th reunion and, uh, Whenever I drive up here, it, it never fails to uh, just move me in extraordinary ways. Because this this school absolutely gave me pretty much uh, everything uh, that I needed to live life, and it, it, it's the the debt I owe to this school and and everything it represents, I could never begin to pay back. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about this memoir, this, uh, this book. This is number 20 of, of my books, but it is, it is, according to my wife, the best book I've written. And it is completely different from any book I've written. It, it was very freeing, because it's the first book I, I've written where I didn't have to give any advice. I just told stories. And um, uh, and I also I also was free to to tell what happened and and uh, I think there was a I discovered when I finished it what I hadn't known when I started it that one of the purposes it, when I when Sue told me to write it I, I said who wants to read a book about me and she said no it's not about you it's your story and and. I realized when I finished it, the reason, or one reason, that I wanted to tell my story is I wanted other people to feel permission to be free to tell theirs, particularly if it involves craziness. Because there's too much stigma that surrounds it. You know, just look at the recent suicides. There's just too much shame and stigma that prevents people from uh, talking about it. and. Plus which, I wanted to show how wonderful <coughs> crazy people can be. The characters in this book, I'm very proud of almost all. There's one who's pretty difficult, but, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but by and large, 
they're, I'm so proud of them, you know, and, and yes, they did have to struggle, but they are, uh, uh, they are so much more interesting than your average man on the street, and, and, and that's, a, that's a fact that most extremely intelligent, creative people do struggle with one or another of the conditions that we diagnose, and that, that's why the diagnostic manual only tells part of the story. And I, I've been saying for years we ought to include the rest of the story in these diagnostic descriptions. We ought to say, and by the way, they tend to be incredibly creative, incredibly deep, incredibly uh, prolific, incredibly astute. I mean, you know, our greatest president suffered from a major mental illness. You know, Abraham Lincoln had major depression. And, and uh, uh, I mean, I, don't worry, I'll get to the book. But I, I, just, <laughs> I, I, I just think uh, we really need to do, we really need to reframe all of this uh, uh, so that people can understand the, the fullness and the, the amount of, of wonderful variety in humanity that's packed into what is so misleadingly labeled mental illness. It, it is sure there there is tremendous suffering in 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 that in these entities, but there's also tremendous genius and tremendous laughter and and fun and celebration. Well, with with that as sort of an introduction, uh, let me read you uh, some selections that I've that I've picked out and. Um, and, and then have a little time for, for, for discussion. And so this is how the book begins. Can you hear me all? I don't need to use the microphone? Okay. So this is the, the opening. I come from an old New England wasp family, characterized by what I call the wasp triad alcoholism, mental illness, and politeness. <laughs> you could be tipsy, even quite sloshed. You could be a bit off, even mad as a hatter. But none of that really mattered, as long as you were polite. The point was never to let life rock you over much. Be debonair under duress, be cool under attack, be a good egg. No tears. We specialized in a pitiless pragmatism that deplored sentimentality and revered character. You paddled your own canoe, and if you fell out, well, fare thee well. These things happen. No matter what, we carried on. Rather than ever show sadness, we bucked up. Rather than get angry, we practiced the velvet art of courteous cruelty. You could be as nasty as you wanted to be, as long as you did it with wit and a smile. <laughs> Above all, your job was to be a good sport. Expressing painful feelings was self-indulgent and embarrassing and created an uncomfortable mess no one wanted to be part of or to clean up. We all knew what a raw deal life could be, but our way of making do was to look it in the eye and with the tip of the hat walk on by. If we couldn't beat the devil, we could at least refuse to let him shut us down. Happiness lay in never taking anything too seriously. These are my people, and I love them. But I took a different turn. When I was born, my mom said she held me in her arms in the hospital and looked down at me with high hopes. You were the cutest baby in the world, she told me. You had two perfect dimples and a little mole on your cheek. I said it was where the brownie kissed you. I knew you'd make us all happy again. So those were my marching orders. Make people happy. It seems most of us are born into certain roles, and that was mine. That it ended up being what I would do for a living speaks to the powerful, invisible forces that shape each of us from the moment of conception. I learned many years later from my mother that I was conceived when my dad was on leave from the mental hospital. Mistakenly given a pass when he shouldn't have been, upon arriving at home he decided for no apparent reason that he wanted to murder my mother. There was my mother facing a psychotic man in a murderous rage who happened to be her husband. But she was amazing at handling men. It was her great talent in life, even though things didn't work out well for her. 
when my father told my mother he wanted to kill her, she didn't freak out. How she remained calm, I don't know. But somehow she talked him into making love instead of killing her. She told me this herself. After they made love, Dad got out of bed and put on his galoshes. After a while, my mother heard a loud noise and went outside where she found him standing stark naked in a snowy cornfield. They lived on a farm outside Boston. Wearing nothing but his galoshes, he was shooting crows out of the sky with a shotgun. He thought the crows were Nazi planes. He'd draw, he'd draw a bead on one, then bam, blow one up, then another, leaving feathers and blood all over the field. People on the adjoining property called the police, and the police came. But the poor cops didn't dare go anywhere near my father when they got there. I guess dis disarming a naked man known in the town to be a war hero who was shooting off a shotgun was not something they were trained for. They looked at my mother, who, artful as ever, sweet-talked my dad into giving her the gun and coming inside. That's how my mother became pregnant with me, a unique beginning for a psychiatrist. <laughs> Since when I was born, my father was in a mental hospital. My extended family all lived on my uncle's farm to give my mother help with my two older brothers and me. Mom would visit dad several times a week. Nobody talked much about my father's condition, as insanity was thought shameful not a state of mind any respectable person ever entered, as if it were a venereal disease, contracted voluntarily and irresponsibility, irresponsibly. If she mentioned him at all, my father's mother, whom I called Gammy Hallowell, would tell people her son Ben was in need of a rest. When I was a toddler, Dad was in different hospitals, Taunton State, Baldpate, and the VA. He was diagnosed as schizophrenic and underwent numerous shock treatments, both electric shock an insulin-induced hypoglycemic shock. When I was about three, a smart young doctor put Dad on a new medication, lithium. And presto, he got better, and soon thereafter was discharged. If he'd been put on lithium sooner, my family might have been saved. Well, they got divorced, and uh, because the, the doctors told uh, the doctors told my mother there was no hope, and so and so she uh, proceeded to marry uh, a, a man in, in Chatham. This is down on Cape Cod, uh, who I instantly loved because he was very good at uh, making me love him, and uh, I called him Uncle Unger, and. Um, he was a charming southern gentleman, very urbane, very witty, and he would play soccer with me in the backyard. And, and he had this uh, maid, Millie, well, Joey is what I call her in here, colored maid, that was what they were called. If you, if you were black, you were called colored back then. And she sort of took care of me uh, as Unger and my mother became alcoholic together. And, uh, uh, I didn't know what was happening. And, and Joey, Millie, I call Joey in the book, would take me around to her friends in Harwich, wonderful friends, Portuguese, African American, <coughs> different uh, ethnic groups, and they were just so much fun. I didn't know she was using heroin, and she would stop and get these little packages, but I, I thought they were, I didn't know what, I was five. And she'd get her uh, whatever drug and drive out, and they'd be, and they were just having so much fun together. And this is an account of one of those trips to, to, to visit her friends. I sat in the passenger seat as Joey drove. We were heading to Harwich to visit Vera, Joey's cousin, and Vera's daughter, Pokey, as well as their friend Bernice, and whichever men were hanging out at Vera's place. She always had good snacks to offer, and the yard was full of chickens, which I had fun chasing. I also liked Pokey. She was much taller than me, but about my age. When we got there, Vera and Bernice were in the kitchen, smoking as usual. No men today, and no other children except Pokey. After Joey gave Bernice a little envelope that looked a lot like the one she'd taken from Topper, she lit up, lit up a cigarette too, as Vera called, Pokey, time for your bath. There was a big aluminum tub in the kitchen, which Vera had filled with hot water. 
Nettie, you ought to take your you ought to take a bath with Pokey. I stared at the tub in disbelief. The ladies laughed a little at this idea, but I could sense they meant it. Come on, jump in the tub. Pokey came in and without so much as a buy your leave, stripped off her clothes and climbed into the tub. Wow! I was excited because I had never seen a girl naked before. I didn't see much beyond a fleeting glance when she got into the tub, but I was eager for more. Still, I felt beyond shy about taking off my clothes. No way was I going to do that. It's okay, Bernice said to the others. They're all still babies. I don't think we need to worry about Henny Hanky Panky. Vera giggled at the thought, and Joey chimed in. Come on, Nettie, take your bath now, and you won't have to at home. I don't want to. Come on, Pokey said. It'll be fun. I looked up. I looked down. I didn't know what to do. Come on, Nettie, Joey said. You'll be getting naked with girls for the rest of your life. They all laughed. I don't know what gave me the courage. I guess Joey's urging was all I needed, because in a moment I was naked in the tub with Pokey. The women took their cigarettes and iced tea, or whatever was in those tall glasses, into the sitting room, leaving, leaving Pokey and me alone in the tub. Even though she wasn't older than me, Pokey seemed more mature, less silly. She could tell I was nervous, so she said, I bet you ain't never seen a girl naked before, have you? And then she laughed, not like laughing at me, but like she was saying it was really okay not to have seen a girl naked. I guess not, I said. Well, I did bring my stepsister a drink when she was in the bathtub, but she was covered with soap suds, so I couldn't see anything. You want to see me? Without waiting for an answer, Pokey stood up so I could see what was or wasn't between her legs. I looked up at her face, then down at her vagina, staring at it for what seemed like forever, except it wasn't forever. Before I knew it, Pokey giggled and sat down again in the tub. Now it's, nor now it's your turn, she said, and giggled again. <laughs> As if it were simply what I had to do, I stood up and let Pokey see me, then quickly sat down, making a splash. What's going on in there, Vera called. We're just washing, Pokey called back, giggling again. Pretty soon we were splashing each other and making a racket. So Vera called in, you two better quiet down in there or I'll come in and give you what for. Shh, Pook Pokey said to me. What's what for, I asked. It's a spanking, Pokey said, and you surely do not want one from my mom. Okay, I said, still giddy over what I'd just seen. I'll try to be quiet. When we finished our baths, dried off and got dressed, Vera gave us each a drumstick and a scoop of potato salad. Driving home, Joey asked, why are you so quiet? No reason, I said. But of course, there was a huge reason. I didn't know what that space with what looked like vertical lips actually was on Pokey, but I guess I'd find out someday. It meant Lindy had one like it, only not brown, and so did my stepsisters and all the girls in my class. I also knew I liked seeing it. I hoped Pokey and I could take baths often together. I turned over lots of questions on the car ride home, but I didn't know who to ask of them. Who, who to ask them of? Jamie, I thought. Jamie will know. That turned out to be the only bath Pokey and I ever took together. It was one of the sweetest, most educational experiences of my life. <laughs> so, talking about going out for Sunday dinner and Unger drinking his Manhattans and watching him slowly change as, as he would drink, and then uh, how I admired him even though I came to hate him. He always wore a sports jacket, usually tweed, sometimes camel hair, one of his Brooks Brothers button-down shirts, usually yellow, white, or pink, and a carefully knotted tie set off by a gold collar pin in the shape of a classic safety pin. Even though he knew what he was going to order, he'd study the menu as if looking at it for the first time, wearing his thick tortoiseshell reading glasses, which he would remove after ordering, but then don once again to study the check at the end of the meal, and I mean study. The bill could not have been complicated, but he would bear down on it, on, on it as if Henry's restaurant and he were in a competition to see who could cheat whom. Sometimes he'd get mad at me because I'd inadvertently kick his legs under the table and he'd order me outside. And sometimes I'd kick his legs on purpose, wanting to annoy him. This is how we were with each other. We fought every day, and I hated him. But at the same time, I was drawn to him. I loved his collar pin. Why does a nine-year-old boy love his stepfather's collar pin? And I loved how his shoes were always shined, loafers, the color and sheen of polished mahogany. 
He taught me to shine shoes using a small brush to apply kiwi shoe polish from a round tin. From a round tin, you had to pry open with a coin, buffing them with a horsehair brush first, then with a shoe shine rag, adding a little spit at the end to make it, quote, shine up real good. He could be like a real dad. Without meaning to, he taught me that a kid can love someone he also hates. It was all so confusing. One night, Uncle Unger came home late from the annual meeting at the Yacht Club, which was only a few hundred yards from our house. It had been a night devoted to heavy drinking and gambling. Even though I was on the third floor, he woke me up when he came in with a couple of other men. The next thing I knew, he was calling me down from my bedroom. I got out of bed, went downstairs, and found him in his bedroom, my mother lying with her nightgown hiked up, passed out on their bed, and the two other men standing next to Unger shooting dice using my mother's uncovered naked rear end as the backstop. A big heap of cash lay on the bed next to her like so much trash. Watch, Unker said, you might learn something. I wasn't used to seeing my mother naked, even partially naked as she was then. I remember wondering if it was really her, even though I knew it was. I didn't know what craps was, so I had no idea why they were throwing dice against her bottom, but I did know it was wrong. I wanted to stop them, but I didn't know how. Later, I, I thought I should have done something and felt bad that I hadn't. Unger and his friends were so drunk they didn't notice me silently retreating upstairs to my room. Nothing was said the next day. It was as if it never happened. I don't think my mother even knew it did. I didn't say anything because I was half pretending it hadn't happened myself. I was, long, I was long past the stage of lodging complaints. It was always at night. Later that same year, Unger called me down to their bedroom in the wee hours and handed me a hatchet he'd given me for my tenth birthday. My mother was sitting in the love seat across the room. Boy, I want you to throw this hatchet so it sticks into the door. Why, I asked him. Because you've never used this hatchet since I gave it to you, and I want you to learn how. He didn't know it, but I've been throwing that hatchet at trees outside and in Bobby's in my fort down at the old pier ever since he'd given it to me. I would just always return it to the same place, so he must have thought I never played with it. I thought throwing a hatchet indoors would be fun. I would have thought it was against the rules, but I assumed Unger was so drunk he was suspending those rules. But then came the catch. At night there was always a catch. When he was drunk, that's when stuff got weird. If the hatchet doesn't stick in the door and stay, then I'm going to pick it up and throw it at your mother's head. This time, he'd lost his power. Unlike the time when the men were shooting the dice and I felt transfixed and scared, this time a switch got flipped. Instead of being terrified, terrified, I flat out didn't believe him. He was trying to scare me or toughen me up or whatever twisted purpose he had in mind, I didn't know. What bizarre and malign design he had in mind for me doing, during those years with him, I would never figure out. But I do believe a dangerous madness was in play over and beyond the effects of alcohol. There was something blazingly insane raging inside him. He hid it from the world, but not from my mother and me. It kept us on constant alert. But that night, his spell over me finally broke. Sooner or later, fear peters out. I was able to manage his madness that night with no damage done. I knew he wouldn't throw that hatchet at my mother's head. I remember, maybe for the first time ever, not feeling the least bit afraid of him. He was just nuts. Still, I didn't want to call his bluff on the off chance that, drunk as he was, he might just throw it out of drunkenness. You better hit that door, he said as, men as menacingly as he could manage, an Edward G. Robinson snarl if ever there was one. I, ca I calmly took the hatchet from him. Because I'd thrown it at so many trees, I knew it would stick. I wanted the charade to be over, so I didn't give Unger the drawn-out drama he was looking for. I just threw the stupid hatchet. It stuck in the middle of the bedroom door with a shudder. Perfect hit. He was disappointed. Go back to bed, he said gruffly. I looked over at my mother, whose eyes were closed. I was glad that she'd passed out. I knew she was safe. And for the first time in the longest while, I knew that I was safe as well. So then... Thankfully, my mother sent me away out of that really terrible situation to a boarding school outside of Boston called Pheasant, and, and uh, my grandmother uh, was able to pay for it. It was not expensive back then. I bet the tuition was less than $1,000 a year. And so I showed up at the age of 10 um, uh, to boarding school. And... Um, I was asked to see the school psychologist. So one day I got a note instructing me to report after lunch to the office of Dr. Merritt, the school psychologist. 
I walked down the basement corridor, a corridor I'd sometimes run through in the middle of the night as a game, following the night watchman's rounds. I passed a couple of classrooms before arriving at the tiny piano practice room that served as Dr. Merritt's office. There was only room for an upright piano and bench, and two wooden chairs facing each other in front of a window. When I arrived, the door was open. Dr. Merritt waved me in. I took a seat across from him. Dr. Merritt wasn't young. He was quite puffy and chubby, dressed in a rumpled black suit, a wrinkled white shirt, and a nondescript black tie. He wore glasses, but one eye was covered with a white gauze patch. I had a procedure on my eye, were his very first words. Oh, I said. Then there was silence. I had never seen a psychologist before, or any kind of professional in the world of mental health, so I didn't know what was up. I looked at the floor, waiting for some guidance. You're Hallowell? Yes, that's me, I said. I didn't know if I should stand and shake his hand, but decided against it. Your mother called the school and asked you have a visit with me. Do you know why she did that? No. Do you know who I am? I think so. I'm the school psychologist. Yes, that's what I thought. Well, how about if you tell me about your life so far? I remember starting to talk, and then out of the blue, the floodgates opened. I talked and talked and cried and cried. I do not remember a single word I said, but I was in that room for a good half hour. Dr. Merritt sat there, not saying a single word. What happened next makes me believe he was either the best or the worst psychologist on the planet. <laughs> he said, you can go now. We do not need to meet again. I left his office, went to the gym, changed my clothes, and went out onto the soccer fields. I thought no more about my visit with Dr. Merritt. Looking back, I would not have dismissed a 10-year-old boy who just tearfully sobbed out a story about family turmoil. But that's me. I've always been a sucker for a sob story. I've always been the one who jumps in to save. Maybe Dr. Merritt was smarter than that. Maybe he thought it best for me to seal over those memories and let Fessenden, rather than him, save me. And that's pretty much what happened. Mm -hmm. And then, after Fessenden, I had the great good luck to get admitted to this place. Senior year at Exeter, 1967-68, was the most transformative year of my life, largely due to the influence of one man, my English teacher, Fred Tremolo, Italian for three evils, as he, an, et an etymology maven, liked to remind us. In September, I handed in a short story I wrote, which he handed back to me the next day with these words written in red pen at the end. Why don't you turn this into a novel? As I looked at that comment, that intimidating question, I thought to myself, gee, I always knew Exeter was a tough school, but I never thought I'd have to write a novel. <laughs> the more I thought about it, though, the more excited I became. Mr. Tremolo hadn't challenged anyone else to write a novel, as far as I know, as far as I knew. What made him think I could turn the three-pager I'd handed in into a 300-page novel? Why had he singled me out? I did want to be a writer. That was my number one career goal. Maybe Fred thought I had it in me. I started to mull it over more and more. In fact, I thought of little else. A couple of days later, I spoke with him after class and said I'd like to give the novel a try. But how do I do it, I asked. How do you write a novel? Scene by scene, Mr. T replied without even, pause, without even pausing to think. You know what you want to write about. You laid it out in the story. So just do what we've been discussing in class, focus on scenes, details, character. Write what you know. But how do I organize it? Don't worry about that now, he said. Just write. Trust your unconscious. It was incredibly freeing advice. Just write. Organize later. And let your unconscious have a hand in doing that as well. Once your unconscious catches on to the fact that you're doing this, Mr. T went on, it will start working on it round the clock, 24-7. That's the beauty of the unconscious. Okay, I'll give it a try. One thing, though, Mr. T added, you'll have to do this on your own time. This will not be an assignment, so you'll have to do all the assignments the rest of the class is doing. You won't be excused from anything. You're taking on additional work for which you'll get no credit. Do you understand? Yes, I said, wondering what in the world I had gotten myself into. <laughs> 
Each week I added pages, which Mr. T would read and comment on. At one point he gave me a book by Wayne Booth called The Rhetoric of Fiction, which I read as carefully as a rabbi reads the Torah. Only, unlike the rabbi, I, under I didn't understand a word of it. But Mr. T had given it to me, which meant it must contain what he thought I needed to know about writing. So I read it with the utmost dedication, even though I couldn't decipher its messages. Maybe my unconscious did. <laughs> Evenings, I would go over to Mr. T's apartment. He lived in Wentworth, the dorm next to Bancroft. <clears throat> and we'd talk about life. These sessions meant the world to me. Sometimes other kids were there, sometimes just me. His wife, Ellie, would offer us juice and cookies, and we'd sometimes smoke cigarettes. This was permitted in a faculty member's apartment or in the designated common rooms. We talked about everything under the sun. In French class, we were reading Albert Camus' L'Etranger, and I was very drawn to its main character, Merceau. The first lines of the novel were, Aujourd'hui, maman est morte, ou peut-être hier, je ne sais pas. Today my mother died, or maybe yesterday, I'm not sure. In many ways, like Merceau, I attended life, watching, feeling on the outside, looking in, not quite sure how to get to the inside, the meat, the main event. Mr. T and I talked about existentialism at great length. So much so, I thought philosophy was existentialism, that Camus and Sartre defined philosophy. Never mind Plato, Descartes, Nietzsche, or Schopenhauer. I barely even heard of them, let alone knew what they said. It was Camus, Sartre, and L'Absurdité de la Vie. In that same French class, we read Sartre's We Close, No Exit, which I found incredibly bleak, but also compelling. Hell is other people. But the actual line in the play, Mr. T jumped in when I brought it up to him, is not Hell is other people. It's L'Enfer, c'est les autres, which is not exactly the same thing. Sartre was getting at something more subtle, the impossibility of knowing yourself, except through the distorted mirror of other people. And if he, even if he did mean it the other way, Mr. T went on, that's not surprising because Sartre's childhood was pretty difficult. His father died when he was two and he was ra raised by his mother's father and his mother who was ridiculously intrusive and overly affectionate. Plus, Sartre was short, ugly, and wall-eyed. Not a happy beginning. So you think his bleak philosophy is just because of his unhappy childhood? No, Mr. T replied. Sartre was a genius and a great philosopher. I'm just saying his childhood must have colored his outlook, just as your childhood has colored, has colored yours, wouldn't you say? I'm sure it has, I said. I'm just not sure exactly how. My childhood was such a mixed bag of really good and kind of bad. You're writing about it well, Mr. T said. Thanks, I replied. He had no idea how much praise from him meant to me. Or maybe he did. All my life, I've had a terrible habit of telling the truth, uh, the truth as I see it, blurting it out, you could say, regardless of how inappropriate it might be. It's gotten me into more trouble than I care to recount. Why do you want to become a psychiatrist? That was the question I was asked in every interview at every training program I applied to during my fourth year of medical school. This was the time to say something like, because I've always been interested in the workings of the mind, or I had a great mentor in medical school who got me excited about psychiatry, or the brain is the last frontier of human discovery and I want to join the explore, uh, exploration. All of those are solid, sane responses to the question. One of those, or one similar to those, is what I should have said, and what I would have said had I learned the practical skill of being politic and appropriate. But that skill never came easily to me. Being honest came so much more naturally. So my answer to that question was, because I come from a crazy family. Most interviewers stopped dead in their tracks, as if I'd just farted. <laughs> then they'd find some excuse to pause and regroup. I remember one man in particular who looked to be a junior faculty member, only a few years older than me, natalie dressed, wearing a bow tie. When I told him I came from a crazy family, he took off his eyeglasses and nervously started to clean them with the balled-up hanky that he pulled out of his trouser pocket, as he tentatively asked, without looking at me directly, Crazy? Oh yes, crazy, I replied emphatically. They were definitely crazy. Lots of my type are. My family were all interesting people, just often drunk or crazy or both. 
This interviewer, having no clue as to what a fitting response might be, simply stared back at me. But telling him some of my stories seemed important to me. I felt then what I've continued to feel my entire career, that psychiatry shies away from the real story and tries to dress it up in jargon and scientific sounding nomenclature as if to make it presentable to a general audience. Also, the point of an interview is for the program to get to know the actual candidate, not the tidied up version. So I saw no need to tiptoe. My father was bipolar, but first was misdiagnosed schizophrenic. He went crazy when he came back from World War II. He'd been an all-American hockey player at Harvard, led the nation in scoring, married my mother after a storybook romance, got a job at Goldman Sachs, had my two older brothers, but then went off to war. When he came home, he wasn't right, as they used to say. Fact is, he was nuts, so he was put in a hospital where he got insulin shock and electric shock. It was gruesome, but the doctors were just trying to help, so that's what you did back then. My bow-tied interview nodded, confirming an historical fact. I was glad at last to make some connection with him. But the next part of what I say, say, had to say really threw him for a loop. I told him the story of how I was con conceived, complete with the dead crows and the summoning of the police. That about finished him. He had clearly heard way more than he'd wanted, having twice taken off his glasses, wiped them, and put them back on while I was talking. I'm surprised he didn't break them in two. He polished them so aggressively. Now he was back to his default position, staring and at a, at a loss. Of course, that was in Massachusetts, I said, so you wouldn't know the hospitals where he was treated. My interviewer said nothing. Feeling the acute and throbbing awkwardness between us, which threatened to take the interview clear into the twilight zone, I tried to help out. I'm sorry, I was just trying to be honest. You know these interviews get pretty boilerplate, so I was just trying to be a little bit real. This is my third one today. I don't know. I hope it's okay. I probably shouldn't have said so much. But it is psychiatry, after all. But anyway, I'm sorry. I can understand that this all feels like too much. I have a habit of going overboard. The man heaved a sigh, and his whole being seemed to defervesce, as if a mental abscess had just been drained. <laughs> I could feel his relief as if it were a hug. You're right, he said. This is my third interview, too. They are so boilerplate. You have no idea how tedious they can become. So thank you for changing it up a bit. Yes, you did that for sure. He chuckled, having, re having regained control of the situation. The tension broken, we ended up having a great interview and talking no more about my crazy father or crazy anybody, but safe topics like theories of the mind and the Yankees versus the Red Sox. <laughs> Telling the truth, or your own version of the truth, is a bad habit if you want to get ahead in this world. But it is also a habit that, in spite of many punishments, I've not been able to shake. I wanted to become a psychiatrist because I wanted to understand my, peop my people in particular and crazy people in general. I felt totally at home with crazy people, but I knew the world at large didn't understand them at all and felt anything but at home with them. I wanted to do something about that. Based solely on statistics, the interviewer, any interviewer, should have rejected me from the program. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study provides a score based on the number of specific adverse events in a person's childhood, like parental divorce, alcoholism in the family, mental illness in the immediate family, and seven others. A score of four or higher strongly predicts terrible outcomes in adulthood, like major depression, chronic unemployment, inability to stay in relationships, alcoholism, early death, and suicide. My score is eight. <laughs> Fortunately, statistics does allow for outliers. A few people, like me, beat the odds. I was accepted into that residency program and many others. Thankfully, the people in charge of these programs paid more attention to my academic record and what I was like as a person now than they did to what the statistic based on my childhood would predict would happen to me as an adult. Most people with my background who do survive do not thrive. They become cynical and pretty weather-beaten. They tend not to trust, to put it mildly. I, however, became a gullible, wide-eyed optimist. The price I paid is that I carry a lot of sadness inside me. That, that also gives me a deeper understanding of other people's sadness that lectures and books can't provide. Without knowing exactly why, I heeded the inner voice that persisted even after initially getting rejected from medical school, the inner voice that had visited the little boy that hot day in Chatham. My career path wasn't so much a choice as it was a necessity, a tropism, like a sunflower turning toward the sun. Skip that one. Uh, no, I have, but I have to read you this one. <laughs> uh, this, this one is. Uh, can I do a couple more? 
Please. So, one steamy August night during my OBGYN rotation, the air conditioning in Charity Hospital shut down. Charity Hospital was this wonderful hospital in New Orleans where I, when I went to medical school with Tulane. It was destroyed by Katrina, which was a great loss. Anyway, without AC, the hospital air was all but liquid. As the night wore on, I had to change my scrubs over and over because they were sopping wet from my sweating. If I was hot and dripping, just imagine what the women in labor were going through. We all work together to keep them as comfortable as possible, but the words comfortable and labor don't usually appear in the same sentence. Around three in the morning, a woman in her 30s came in to deliver her 14th baby. She was assigned to me. I brought a cold washcloth to her bedside as I introduced myself. She gave me a big smile as she gladly wiped her face with the cool cloth. Sweet Jesus, did the AC go out in this place? Oh, Lordy, I don't know what I'm going to do. Did it really go out, she wailed. I'm afraid so, I said, and then after looking down at the chart, added Harmony. Well, this baby ain't going to wait, I can tell you that. I don't need you to do much, though. I've done this a few times before. With a loud grunt, she shifted her large frame around on the cramped gurney, trying to find the least awkward position. There ain't no easy way. You just want it quick. And I don't want no drugs and no pesiotomy. They just love pesiotomies here, Charity. I'm telling you, I don't want one. You hear me? Yes, ma'am, I, I do, I said as forcibly as I could. She was correct. The Tulane Department of OB at the time mandated that all vaginal births include an incision diagonally downward from the vagina, a procedure called an episiotomy. But I believed this woman had enough experience giving birth that I could obey her command and simply let the procedure go its natural way. All of a sudden, Harmony let out a whoop. Honey, it's coming. At that moment, my hand was inside of her, using my fingers to measure how dilated her cervix was. I'm plenty dilated up, if that's what you're checking, or maybe you're just having a good time down there. She let out a hoot scream of laughter pain and then gave my free hand a titanic squeeze. Next thing I knew, she was crowning and the baby shot out into my waiting hands. It's a boy, I announced, trying to add something useful to the procedure. <laughs> My twelfth boy, I'm a regular ding oh, kind of <laughs> Clean him up good now and let me hold him, you hear me? With the help of the nurse, we shuck, suck, suctioned and patted and dried. He was adorable. Actually, I found all the babies adorable. OB was by far my favorite rotation in medical school. In that one month of August, I delivered 35 babies. When I handed this squinchy-faced infant to his mom, Harmony looked down at him and heaved a sigh. Something was bothering her. As her eyes flooded with love, unmistakable even with number 14, she looked up at me with a troubled look. Doc, you could help me with one thing. Anything, just ask. Honey, I am fresh out of names. I came here expecting a girl, don't you see? And then I get another boy. He's beautiful for sure, but I just don't have a name for him. If he'd been a girl, she was going to be Georgina, after my best girlfriend by the name of Georgina, of course. But seeing as he's a boy, well, Georgina won't do. And I just plain do not like the name George. So I was thinking, as I've been laying here, maybe that nice doctor's got a name for my baby. In the middle of the night, in the sweltering heat and humidity of Charity Hospital in August, with no, no AC, my brain was on tilt. Without a second thought, without even pausing for a millisecond, years later I would learn this is what peop we people who have ADD are prone to do. I proposed, how about Fenway Park? Ho, oh, Harmony crowed. How about that? That's a right classy name. I love that. How you say again? Fenway Park? No, no, I sputtered. I was just joking. You can't name it Fenway Park. That's the name of the baseball field in Boston, the city I come from up north. I know where Boston is, child. One of my sisters lives there with her fat, no good husband. Oh, no, I take that back. Lord, I forgive me. He is a good man. He treats her fine. Just some days I wish he could work harder instead of laying on his fat, no count butt. Shut your mouth, Harmony. Lord, forgive me. Anyways, Doc, I'm glad to name this boy after a place in Boston in honor of my mighty fine sister. Really, I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> Fenway Park is the name of a baseball field. He's going to be stuck with this name, and he may get ma made fun of because of it, and he may not thank you for giving it to him. In fact, he may be very angry with you, not to mention me. Please, I can come up with some normal names for you. Bob, Joe, Frank. <laughs> Too late, Doc. He can change his name if he wants to when he gets old enough. But for now... 
I'm in charge, and my new son's name is Fenway Park. <laughs> it's a gift you've given me, Doc. It's a right classy name. I am grateful to you and to the good Lord for sending me this beautiful name for my beautiful son, number 12. I'll <laughs> run. <laughs> And then I'm into residency at Mass Mental. We residents at Mass Mental often worry too much that one of our patients would commit suicide. It made, it made us defensive and overly protective of our patients. The former illustrious head of the hospital, Jack Ewalt, the man whom Miles Shore replaced, was famous for saying, if there weren't a few suicides every year, we weren't doing our jobs right. He didn't really mean it. He was being flippant, as was his wont. But he was trying to drive home the point that if we got too concerned about preventing suicide, We'd practice overly cautious medicine and would keep patients in the hospital too long, not giving them the chance to take responsibility for their own lives. I was lucky that none of my patients committed suicide while I was in training. My one patient who did commit suicide came to me early in my private practice. Hannah suffered from borderline personality disorder and was chronically suicidal. She was referred to me by her latest doctor who decided he had nothing more to offer her so it was time for a change after her umpteenth admission and discharge from a local hospital. In her mid-thirties when we had our first visit, she'd been in and out of hospitals since age 16. She was attractive still with blonde hair and some makeup, but she, still had, the, but she had the sunken eyes and pallid look of a person who suffered emotionally long and hard. I could feel how tired of life she'd become, and yet how tough and courageous she'd been to make it this far. Fighting off the wish to die is exhausting and demands enormous strength. Where she found it, I have no idea, but find it she did, year after year after year of wanting to die. In our first meeting in my tiny rented office in Harvard Square, the then famous 51 Brattle Street, she said to me, I can't live like this any longer. I'm not going to go back into the hospital ever again. I can't live my, li my life in and out of hospitals. I don't want to, and I can't. She was speaking as forcefully as she could. What's our plan if you become suicidal, I asked. It's up to me to figure that out, she said. I've had the best doctors in the world. I've had every medication in God's creation. I've had every form of therapy there is. And I just do not want to keep living like this. Would you? No, I wouldn't, I replied. What does your family think? There's only my mother, she said, and she agrees with me. Hannah had made many horrific suicide attempts, mutilating, mutilating herself in hideous ways that caused her enor enormous shame and distress. She'd been unable, despite the efforts of some great hospitals and doctors, to control herself. Today, perhaps dialectical behavior therapy or DBT could have helped her, but we didn't have that back then. I made an agreement with Hannah and her mother that I would see her as an outpatient regularly. She came to my office twice a week, always on time, and we talked about her life, her hopes, her feelings. Her mother had invited her to live with her, but she preferred shelters. Her hope was to find a job and maybe a good man. We made a compact that if she felt suicidal, she would contact me before hurting herself. We knew that the urge to hurt herself would pass if she could wait long enough, and my job was to help her wait. How can we be sure you will abide by our agreement, I asked. I think we both know the answer to that question, Hannah replied. We can't be sure. I'm addicted to suicide attempts, and it's up to me to break the habit. I hope you'll try, I hope you will try to let me help you, I said. So do I, Hannah replied. One day I got a call from her mother telling me that Hannah had succeeded in taking her own life. I will never forget what the mother said to me. Thank you, doctor, for giving my daughter the chance to live life on her own terms. I think we all knew it would probably end this way. But thank you for giving her the chance, at least, to try to make a, a life she could enjoy. It haunts me that today we have better treatments for what Hannah struggled with than we did then. Maybe her life could have been saved. But this is always my lament. It's every healer's lament. If only I could have done this, that, or the other thing, the bad outcome could have been averted. Like most doctors, I have a hard time accepting that terrible stuff happens. But sometimes neither I nor anyone else can prevent it no matter what. Sometimes a person wants to die, not just for a day, but week after week, month after month, and year after year. One way or another, they are determined to make it happen. There's only so much we can do or should do to prevent it. The dicey question is, how much is too much? I knew Hannah for only six months or so, but I always found a heroic quality about her. 
She struggled with a terrible condition for many years, doing her best to quell the most painful and destructive feelings a person can have. She fought to live, and in the end insisted on living life on her terms, with dignity and freedom, or not at all. It was in knowing Hannah and others like her, people whose courage and will to live burned fiercely even in the face of massive shame and self-hatred, of abuse and deprivation the like of which I couldn't imagine that I started to believe again in what I'd been taught in St. Michael's Church and taught by Fred Beekner at Exeter and in Bill Alfred's study at Harvard. We do not die. We live forever. There is a life in the world to come. I just could not imagine that the fervor with which Hannah lived, the courage, pride, and love that surged through her and kept her alive, no matter how challenged, humiliated, and defeated she felt, no matter how much the world ignored or despised her, no matter how much she despised herself, I couldn't imagine that the part of her that could hope and feel love, the part of her that could sit in my office and say, I want to give life a try, could ever die. It simply felt impossible, like a violation of a basic rule of physics. Well, maybe that's a good place to stop. Well, I read your book, and I'm glad you put the family tree in it. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> that was very helpful. Yes, that was the publisher's idea. Yes. The editor said, I can't keep these people straight. Yeah, uh, very hard. Uh, uh, yes. So I'm a pediatrician, recently retired. Yes. From a community health center up the street. Yes. Uh, and I use your Driven to Distraction book as my Bible. Thank you. Work, and I... Currently, I'm just seeing kids once a week to do ADHD management, really. Great. So my interesting question I thought I would ask you, which comes from the press, is why are we having such an increase in the rate of suicide in this country now? And, well, what, and what can we do about it? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I, I have an answer to that, and I think it's the same as the answer to why are we having an increase in, in school shootings. I think this, it's the same answer. I think Could we're. You speak a little louder. Yes. Yeah. Why the the answer of why the surge in suicide is the same as the answer of why the surge in school shooting, and and I think it's the increase in in iso social isolation. I think we have the modern paradox of tremendous electronic connection, but interpersonal disconnection. And I think uh, I I date it beginning with Columbine when, you know, that was the first big school shooting, and we were all shocked and stunned. Now it happens so routinely, it barely moves the, you know, the, 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 the meter. Um, uh, people are, you know, the Surgeon General named loneliness as the number one medical problem until Trump fired it. You know, and, and uh, um, people feel lonely, you know, and uh, that's not good for you. You know, it's just not good. And, and it leads you to depression, to drug abuse, <clears throat> ultimately, you know, the worst outcome of depression being suicide, or it leads you, you to rage. You see other people getting all the good stuff, you feel humiliated and rejected, well, I'll, I'll show them, I'll kill them. And, and people scratch their heads, and I just, I go nuts. It's so obvious. Mike Diamani and I did a study at Exeter. We said, you know, Exeter does great with all the brainy stuff, Pay more attention to the, the, you know, the kids who feel isolated and, and on the outside, you know, and, and it's, it's very, if, if every school would pay as much attention to what I call connectedness as they do to reading scores and math scores, we would take care of this. But people don't take it seriously. They just don't. And, and, uh, they say, oh, that's soft. It's not soft at all. It's not soft that you know as a pediatrician. And I'm not saying you have to coach your kid to be popular, but not to be lonely, not to cry into your pillow. And the, the mantra that I, that I push is never worry alone. You know, first grade teachers should write that on the blackboard. Never worry alone, never worry alone. Always never let the sun set on an unshared worry, you know, and... and that's why I think, and, and, and then the stigma against asking for help. It shows weakness and all that. So to me, the answer is clear. And, and the 
solution is also clear. Reduce stigma, uh, encourage pediatricians, teachers, parents to, to tell people not to worry alone, uh, that it's a sign of strength to ask for help, to say I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling vulnerable, I need help. Uh, you know, and, and, and start support groups. Not, it's not therapy. They don't need therapy. They just need support. You know, the Harvard Chemistry Department, I worked with them for a number of years, uh, 10, 15 years ago. They're most, they're most gifted. This is the, the world's leading department. Five Nobel Prize winners on the... Their most gifted graduate student committed suicide and left a note explicitly blaming Harvard, saying this place is so sick that you drove me to suicide. And the chair of the department, Jim Anderson, took it very seriously, and he said, we've got to change things here, we've got to change the culture. He went to Jeremy Knowles, the dean at the time, who's now in heaven, uh, I assume, and uh, uh, um, uh, said, Jeremy, I need $5 million. Jeremy said, we don't have five. El Harvard's great at raising money, not so good. Yeah. Jeremy said, we don't have that money. Jim said, okay, my next stop is the city desk of the New York Times. He had his money the next day, because you know, uh, it would not have looked good, you know, front page, suicide note, plan, you know, so. Uh, and we, he brought me in as a consultant, and we sat about changing the culture of our department. It was hard, because it was one sick place. The, the disconnection and paranoia was entrenched. Nobody trusted anybody. And, and you know, it was just, uh, but we, we did. I mean, and you have to be artful. You have to meet people where, where they are. They wouldn't come out for socials. But they'd come out for food, so we baited them with food, you know, and, and, uh, and then they'd start talking to each other. So I'm glad you asked that question. It's my, it's my passion these days. You know, you, you know, in this book, you know, the sort of the unanswered question, the implied question is, how did I beat the odds with ACES score of eight? I, it's absolutely, it's just a statistical miracle yeah. that I'm here at all, let alone, you know. Uh, and the answer, I believe, which I don't state in the book, is the power of connection. Finding Fred Tremolo, you know, finding the friends, finding the school. I mean, you know, the, people think of Exeter as this harsh place. It was the opposite of harsh for me. I loved it. I even loved the depression I felt here. I loved the, I loved the, I know I loved the Raskolnikov and walking the, the paths to be like, oh, it's such a bleak and dark winter. I loved that. It was, it was wonderful. You know, you know, I felt I was, you know, communing with the dark side of life. You know, it was, it was, I, I, I just, I loved it. It was, it was, you know, and it was, it was, because I could, if you can understand what I mean, I could find it was okay, because it wasn't a dangerous kind of depression that I felt around my stepfather. It was, a, it was a, a depression that I knew it was something to think about, you know, reading Dostoevsky. You know, it, I could come into class and talk about it, and, you know, or the only philosophical question is one of suicide. We could talk about that. And so, you know, it was... I never felt alone, or maybe I was alone in the universe, that kind of alone, but I never felt the kind of alone that leads to suicide. But it's a, I love your question. I wish the Academy of Pediatrics would take this up and make it a, a national issue, because these kids, they don't need antidepressants, I can tell you that. They really don't. Yes? Do you think too many drugs are being prescribed? Oh, yeah, I do. I, I prescribe. If you come to see me, I prescribe vitamin C, vitamin connect. I, I do. I really do. I, I tell people, I, I want you to get a major dose of vitamin connect. So I prescribe a dog. For adults, I prescribe Tinder and Humba and Bumble, you know, if, you, if you're looking for a date. I say, you know, these dating sites, they're, they're great. And uh, uh, I say, go back to church or synagogue, you know, you know and, and they say, but I don't believe in God. I said, that doesn't matter. They won't throw you out. Just show up. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's free uh, groups, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, and, and dogs are the, absolutely the best therapists in the world. I mean, get a dog. I mean, this old, this 80-year-old guy who comes to see me, Dr. Hollowell, you're so right, and the dog comes with him. The dog's, you know, it, it, it's, you know, Vitamin Connect is, it's, uh, it's, uh, the books, this, this is the center of connection. These stores like this, these are wonderful centers of connection. You know, so yeah, you know, the, the meds are way over-prescribed. Now, do I prescribe medication? Sure. Stimulants for ADD are amazingly effective. 
But the SSRIs, I rarely prescribe them. Rarely. And the anti-anxiety agents, rarely. The best anti-anxiety agent is never worry alone. Talk to a friend. You know, get a dog. Go for a walk. Exercise is incredibly good for your brain. Meditation, thousands of years have proven how good meditation is. I mean, you know, it's just we, we are way, way, way too drawn to the pharma solution. I'm not anti-pharma, believe me, but I think we're, we're brainwashed into, into going that route when the other routes are safer and, guess what, more effective and far more sustainable and a lot cheaper. Thank you. Yeah. I also feel that, that we should um, teach failure in high school. Like, not everybody gets a trophy, not everybody's the best. This is always the best. Way. You know, when I was writing my one of my books, I, I, Tingley was the principal of Exeter. I came and interviewed him. I said, what does Exeter do? What's the most important thing Exeter does for its students? And he smiled. He said, we teach them how to fail. <laughs> well, my favorite story is WD-40 which is, you know, the WD is the water displacement. It wasn't originally the sticky, anti-sticky stuff. Yeah. It was supposed to be for rockets or something, but they realized it was good at the anti-sticky. But the 40 is the number of tries it took them to get it right. Oh, no kidding, oh, really. So, yeah. so like, like uh, we don't let kids do 40 tries. We don't let them do five. And what, how many tries did Edison before he came right. up with the tungsten mm -hmm. filament? It was yeah. like 77 or something. Something yeah. amazing. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and, yeah. and so... So kids don't learn, most kids don't learn that, um, or young adults even, that failure is one of the steps on the way to success. So that if nobody's failed until they're 35 and they have a business success or something, they totally fall apart because they don't realize it's, it's just a stepping stone. It's right. just the next. Well, Ex Exeter is very good at teaching things. Well, you got to be careful because we, we <coughs> Sally and I both were on the school board of the other Exeter. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. we, we represented the, the, the leader of the Exeter, yeah, of the Exeter High School. Does Exeter School High School teach failure? No. No. <laughs> oh, they give A's too easily? <laughs> really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well. It's just a different, <laughs> different yeah. level of A, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you became a pediatrician, so you must have gotten a good education then. I went to a public high school in upstate New York, right? Uh. And my parents said if I didn't do well, I could go to the Buffalo Cemetery for girls. The Buffalo Cemetery. That's the private school option. Oh, that's, that's, that's <laughs> the Buffalo Cemetery for girls. That's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, what do you do with the generation, so probably my parents, your parents, that kind of think that me mental illness doesn't really exist. Yeah. You know, the sort of Victorian, like we had to go to school unless you had a temperature above 100, correct? Because like there was no mental health day to stay home from school or, you know, they sort of don't believe in mm -hmm. mental illness. Well, it's not a religious principle, you, you, you tell them. It's not a matter of believing in it. And, and uh, it's fine to say, suck it up and go to school. I think that's a good idea. But if someone, you know, there was a time when depression was rejected and the treatment was suck it up and, and literally people committed suicide. It was rejected as a moral failing. I mean, the moral model is what ruled moral slash theological. You know, you were possessed by the devil and you were supposed to try harder, pray harder, and then you, we'd beat the devil out of you or, or you know, it was, it was a moral slash theological model, and it was unforgiving, unrelenting, and guess what? Wrong. So it, it had its some advantages, because people didn't waste time whining, but it was, it was hideous. The amount, the amount of child abuse that was committed in the name of God is because of that model. And, and, and uh, you know, I still have to because give him a week with me and I'll take care of his ADD, meaning I'll kick yeah, his ass, and, you know. And, and it's, just, it's just so wrong. And these kids get broken and destroyed, and then they're in jail and drugs and, and all of that. So, you know, we really need to get rid of that moral model. And, 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 but what I want is uh, the, a more capacious strength-based model that, rec you know, my model for ADD, for example, race car brain with bicycle brakes. You've got a way powerful brain, but you've got really bad brakes. So if you don't strengthen your brakes, you could end up in jail. 
But if we strengthen your brakes, you'll set the world on fire. But that moral model, don't, 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 don't yearn for the good old days because they were anything but. They were horrible, horrible, sadistic old days. Um, I, this is my first uh, uh, speaker, author. Uh, we walked by, saw the picture, and the uh, cover name pretty much caught all of my attention. <laughs> my mother was diagnosed with schizophrenia eight years ago. Uh -huh. um, I, I guess it's pretty weird to get it at that very, age. Very, very rare. Um, so my, I entered a world of mental health I had never been in before. Yeah. Um, ended up at Mass Mental in Boston. Oh, wow. Um, found her some pretty decent care there. Yeah. It's not easy to get care for, yeah. for that illness. Yeah. Um, but the stigma was tough. I found myself hiding her illness. Yeah. Um, I didn't know how to stand in line with her mm -hmm. when she would tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think now, eight years later, it I'm much better. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to hide it. Mm -hmm. If we're standing in line and she's telling me a story, I just sort of roll with it, yes. you know? And if someone is standing behind us, I'm sure they're thinking, what the hell is going on here? And let them think that. And I do. Yeah. I, I have found yeah. that ability. Um, yeah. And it, there's a level of compassion you get when you have someone that you love that's yeah. struggling with mental illness. Yeah. and. I think it carries over to everything yeah. in your life. Yeah. It's, it's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's like a baby crying on the airplane, you know. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it let the, the people who want to judge. Right. Let them go. Let them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and uh, uh, you know, good boy. That's some, how old is your mom? My mom is seventy-two. Wow. Wow. She was sixty-four. Yeah. 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 Good for you. Is she on getting good medication? Uh, I, I can't say she is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't. She doesn't suffer as greatly. Yeah. Uh, the stories were hellish yeah. uh, for a long time. And yeah. there was a lot of uh, just running <coughs> in fear, but yeah. it's gotten much better. Good. Yeah. Well, we really need to work to break down stigma. Because this. Mental, I prefer to call it mental difference, but mental illness uh, touches almost every family, mm -hmm. particularly if you include substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Do you know what percentage of people with substance use disorder get help? 10%. 90% don't. Mm -hmm. And the help today is so much better than it's ever been before. It's so much more than just 12-step programs. There is medication that really helps a lot. And, uh, what? I thought someone said something. Um, <laughs> what about the access to that? I mean, that's got to... Well, access is a problem. Yeah, you know, insurance, uh, you know, we're, it, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. But uh, in this part of the country, it's better. Um, Maybe in Massachusetts it's better. Yeah, in Massachusetts, <laughs> yeah, Massachusetts not in New Hampshire, better. really, yeah. But access yeah. for people who have schizophrenia is extremely difficult. Because if you don't have someone advocating, yeah. there's... There, because they they don't have a self awareness. Yeah. So join NAMI, the National I did. Alliance for Mental Illness. Yeah, Good. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. No. The, you you need uh, you need family support. That's yeah. the critical key element. To your mother really needs you. Yeah. You have a percentage of the people with mental illness who seek help. Is it similar? Who, who, yeah. No. Who who get about sixty percent? If you sixty percent. No. Who who. 40% get it, 60% yeah. don't, yeah. So we're, we're dealing with, there's no field of medicine, nothing, nothing even comes close where the percentage of people, uh, where, where the consumption of the science lags further behind the, the existence of the science. We know so much, we have so much more to offer than people go and get. Now in my, in my specialty, attention deficit disorder, it's particularly sad because it's such a good news diagnosis. I mean, I love my job. I feel like I'm delivering babies every day. I mean, delivering new lives. And, and people don't understand it. You know, this, this is a good news diagnosis. I mean, adults, that's the biggest undiagnosed group, particularly adult women. I mean, it's, it's yeah, I mean, you rock, you know. And I, when I tell someone, I've got to say, I have great news for you. Your, your life is, is only going to get better. From this day forward, it can only get better. The question is, how much better? You know, so most doctors, you know, have to deliver bad news. 
in my my job, no, it's good news, you know, and and uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's 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 fun to be able to tell someone things can only get better. Yes. And do adults like taking their medication? Like the kids, a lot of them don't like taking their medication. Well, then they're they, then they're not on the right medication. I always, I say to the kid, you're in charge. Don't take it if you don't want to. So it's up to me <coughs> to find a dose of a medication that you want to take. Yeah, and the right, and 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 twenty percent of the time we can't do that. Like in my case, I don't take meds because none of them work for me. But eighty percent of the time we can. And the same thing with the adults. You know, if, if you don't want to, if I can't find a, a dose of a med that hits the sweet spot, then, and my definition is target symptom improvement with no side effects other than appetite suppression without unwanted weight loss. And and so that eighty percent of the time I can hit that. 20% of camp. Well, you all are getting hot. It's probably time for you to go home. Thank you all for coming out.